what up, what up, my people? We're in the booth. The booth. Which booth? Are you kidding? It's the booth of truth, isn't it? Hmm. What a question, eh? Okay, we're in the booth of truth. We're in 1.8 of the politics of guilt and pity, which is so relevant to today. It just beggars belief. Praise God. All right, so let's get on with it. Eight. The politics of suicide. The masochism of man apart from God reaches the point of suicidal activity in its progression. The conclusion of masochism is the politics of suicide. The denial of God is the denial of life and of wisdom. Jesus Christ identified himself as the life, John 14, 6, as the creator and true source of life, so that, apart from him, men have only a love of death and a living death. Speaking as wisdom in Proverbs 8, 36, he said, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. According to Proverbs 8, the world was created by wisdom. Wisdom mediates between God and man. Man is a part of wisdom's plan of creation, and wisdom summons men to righteousness. Jesus Christ identified himself as this wisdom, Luke 7.35, Matthew 11.19, and spoke of his pre-existence, John 8.58. According to St. John, blah, 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 blah. According to St. John, Ak, Ak, why is up? Hang on a sec. John 8, 58. Where? Where's that? Where's John 8, 58? There we go. According to St. John 1, 13 and 18, he is the Word, Logos, or Wisdom of God, and Very God. St. Paul called Christ the Wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and 30, compare Colossians 2, 3. Wisdom is the source and origin of justice and civil government. By me kings reign and princes decree justice, Proverbs 8, 15 and 16. Not only is civil government ordained by God, Romans 13, 1-10, but every principle of law, order, justice, life, community, family, economics, art, science, and all else comes from God. There is no neutral sphere of law in the universe which belongs to nature rather than to God. There is no inherent and self-developed law order in creation in which man may find refuge as a sphere of law in separation from, contradiction to, or supplementary to God's law. The only universe is God's universe. His creation is beloved. And totally under his law. There can thus be no ruling apart from him, no separation conceivable from his law spheres. Hence, to hate the triune God is to love death. All they that hate me love death. Proverbs 8, 36. Thus, the most corrupt civil governments must have some element of true law and order to survive, or else it must have a subsidy from another state to maintain a temporary and artificial existence and stay of death. There must be a measure of the true reward, justice, law, order, family and community within the state for the state to function. The humanist state seeks to make itself the sole principle of organisation. It works to destroy all other allegiances because these allegiances witness against its own claim of ultimacy and testify to a higher law sphere. Thus, the Soviet Union worked to destroy the family, church, community and private lives of its citizens to isolate them from all allegiances save the allegiance to the state. 
travelers to the Soviet Union have noticed as the most immediate discernible characteristic of its people their silence in the streets, the isolation of man even in a large group, the lonely crowd. The isolation of man even in a large group. All the same, the Soviet Union has had to allow a limited amount of family life, for example, and private agricultural and garden plots to farmers for survival purposes. Total communization of the farmer's land would be suicidal. The major production comes from the very small privately farmed plots. By this unconfessed permission of and concession to God's ordained order, agricultural survival is made possible. Every atheist is an unwilling believer to the extent that he has any elements of justice or order in his life, to the extent that he is even alive. Kirillov, in Dostoevsky's The Possessed, was a logical atheist. He committed to suit. He committed suicide as the only practical way of denying God, for he could not live without affirming God. Hell, as the total negation of all law and community, is the logical conclusion and the necessary world of anti-Christian men. The politics of suicide leads to parasitism, since the suicidal state is not only bent on death, but bent on carrying others to death also. The socialist state survives for a time either by being a parasite on its people to the point of their economic destruction, or by being a parasite on some richer state which consents to dis... Some other richer states which consents to subsidize them as the United States, after World War II, has done with much of the world. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Sir. With much of the world. This parasitism leads also to imperialism. The parasite socialist state needs new healthy bodies to feed upon, and, as it destroys one, moves in to destroy another. The ultimate conclusion of the socialist world order is death, a goal required by its very nature. The will to death is thus an inescapable consequence of hostility to the triune God. The will to death also characterises anti-Christian or pseudo-Christian religions. They are joyless and lifeless, and they involve a retreat from life and law, for life and law are inseparably united. Men who are in rebellion against law are in rebellion against life, for laws, God's laws, are the necessary conditions, stays and terms of life. Law is the blood of life, and every sphere of life is a law sphere, and obedience to these laws is personal, moral, spiritual and societal health and life. Praise the Lord for that. Okay, just uh, cut that off too early. Oh, too late. Too late. Too early. Too late. In Solomon's words on law, for length of days and long life and peace shall I add to thee, Proverbs 3 2. Moreover, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he, Proverbs 29 18. Vision is associated, as is happiness, with the keeping of the law. Law means life. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of the wicked. Proverbs 13, 14. Solomon made clear that God's law is man's life and bastion in numerous passages, as witness Proverbs 28, 4 and 5. Concerning these verses, Kidner comments, Without revelation, all is soon relative, and with moral relativity, 
nothing quite merits attack. So, for example, the tyrant is accepted because he gets things done. The pervert, because his condition is interesting. The full sequence appears in Romans 1, 18 to 32. Don't try to narrate with a mouth full of spit. It ain't no good. Even a little bit. Every relativistic philosophy is a rebellion against the conditions of life and hence unconsciously against life. In relativism, man refuses, in effect, to accept the world as already made, as a finished product and a law system. Instead, he holds that the world is a raw mass awaiting creation at man's hands, a meaningless and raw factuality which man must reduce into meaning. By his rejection of the world as it is, God's creation and an established law sphere, man rejects life as it is. Man rejects life as it is in favour of a dream on his terms. Aha, uh -huh, let's try again. Law sphere. Man rejects life as it is. It, man rejects life as it is. Life as it is. Man rejects life as it is. Man rejects life as it is in favour of a dream on his terms. In doing so, man rejects the only life that is. He prefers death to the surrender of the dream of apostate reason. Rebellious man is characterised by what Spengler, with another context in mind, called the dread of reality. The dread of reality is a fear of the real world of God and an insistence that the dream world of reason must supplant it because the dream is a reality. The modern anti-Christian intellectual has been the blindest person of the modern world by his studied hostility to the real world. No one has matched him in his resolute unwillingness to see man as a sinner. For a few centuries he insisted that man is naturally good or, at worst, morally neutral. The intellectual has been unequalled in his... <laughs> The intellectual has been unequalled in his insistence on the total equality of all men, while at the same time maintaining that he constitutes the elites which should rule and remake all things. What a freaking hypocrite! Boop -a -boop -boop. The intellectual has been unequalled in his insistence on the total equality of all men while at the same time maintaining that he constitutes the elites which should rule and remake all things. He has long believed in socialism when socialism has uniformly failed, and it was held to be a mark of intelligence to see Stalin as a great and humane ruler, as long as Stalin lived. The anti-Christian intellectual has been the blindest and least educable, but he has most in but he has been most most insistent. Frickin' A, man! But he has been most insistent on educating and remaking man. President Wallace Sterling of Stanford University, a California educational institution, expressed such plans for the university in June 1966. This distinguished savant upon receiving an honorary degree from McMaster University, stated that our society is now looking towards our colleges rather than our homes, churches and schools to provide a set of... Or, to provide a set or sense of human and... to provide a set or sense of human and moral values as a counteraction to the drive for material success in a world that is becoming depersonalised by computers. According to him, the demand for this new set of moral and human values 
is stemming directly from the studies as well as outsiders. Pff, students couldn't see it. My mince pass! It's a surprise! <laughs> is stemming directly from the students as well as outsiders. End quote. But the essence of apostate man's reasoning is his insistence on independence from God and the assertion of his own claim to be his own God, and therefore such an intellectual must logically claim universal jurisdiction because he is supplanting God and the universal jurisdiction of God's law. Okay, I'm just going to... Yeah... The politics of apostasy is, therefore, the politics of universal jurisdiction of totalitarianism. The states which will not acknowledge God will not thereby leave a vacuum in the universe. The state will fill it. Universal jurisdiction, a cohesive source of unity to every sphere of activity, is a necessary principle if man's world is not to be reduced to meaningless chaos, and if man is not to surrender the possibility of purpose of life, of life in effect. The state, having denied God, will then make itself God. It will claim universal jurisdiction in order to make life meaningful rather than formless. It will thus become a fire-burn Babylon system. It will thus become a Logos incarnate, a platonic idea incarnated in a new republic headed by philosopher kings. Such a state may offer religious liberty to its citizens, but it will be increasingly at the price of shrine worship at its own cults as a necessary condition. The other gods, Christian or otherwise, must thus be lesser gods, or they cannot exist. But the claim to exercise universal jurisdiction and the wisdom and ability to exercise this prerogative are two different things. For a man with all the limitations of man to claim to be as God is to indulge in a dangerous fantasy. For a state, with all the limitations of man compounded, but the power of the sword added to it, to claim to be as God is desperately dangerous and suicidal as well. The modern state is thus doubly involved in the practice. The modern state is thus doubly involved in the politics of suicide. First, its pretensions to universal jurisdiction place the states on a suicidal course. Second, by its rejection of the triune God, the state is suicidal. For all they that hate me Love death. Wow. All right, that was great. Thanks very much for being with me in the booth of truth. Always a pleasure, never a chore. Um, yeah, um, if you want to bless me, please do so. Please go ahead and do so by doing so. And you can do so by going to www.nathanteacher.com.com and uh, you can make a one-off or ongoing donation or like and share and do all those fun things. Thank you very much. And just just working away here, working away, happily working away, getting, getting my stuff done, which is nice. You know, I'm grateful for this booth um, and grateful for the work, grateful to be reading for a living. Um, that's paying the bills at least. And I'm doing a little bit of writing. And I hope to be able to share that with you at some point. All right. So, um, yeah. Uh, any questions or whatever? I don't know. You can ask me. I don't know what questions you might have, but bloody bloody blah, blah, blah. So thanks very much. And I suppose I will see you guys pretty soonish in the next one, hopefully. I mean, one can hope, can't one. <laughs>